As we examine the first three paragraphs of Araby by James Joyce, I'd like to focus especially on symbolism, so symbolism in relation to realism, so realism. And we don't always expect these two things to go together. If, for instance, you walk around your town and you see an apple tree, let's say, in a wild garden, as we have in the story here, you don't necessarily expect this to be a reference to the fall into sin. You just see a tree, right? So realism and symbolism tend to be opposed to each other. They're separate. But in this story, we have this remarkable mixture of the two. And I think that's particularly interesting in these opening paragraphs. Getting right to it then, if you look at the first sentence, it talks about the street, and this street actually exists, being blind. Now, a blind street is a cul-de-sac. It's a dead-end street, as you can see from the image uh, here. And um, blindness is uh, an important metaphor in the story, because at the end of the story, the boy gains insight, he has an epiphany, as we'll talk about, and he suddenly sees things clearly. So blindness, then, is this symbolic thing that's going to res resonate later in the story. It's a quiet street, except at the hour when the Christian Brothers School set the boys free, and the Christian Brothers are an organization in the Catholic Church. They also sponsored schools at the time in Ireland and elsewhere. Uh, and this particular school is setting the boys free. So the language here means that not only are they let out at the end of the day, but it's as if they are captive, as if the school is this place where they are constrained and not free. As you can see then, uh, James Joyce is quite critical of the Catholic Church, and that comes through in the entire story. It also talks about an uninhabited house of two stories that stood at the blind end. So if we picture this, so I'll just kind of draw a picture here, we have this uninhabited house at the end of the road, and the end of the road is right there then, right? You can go only one direction. But we also have these other houses, and these other houses, here we go, are kind of staring at each other in the text. So we have these other houses on either side, and it says they are gazing at one another with brown imperturbable faces. Imperturbable means not showing much emotion. So what we have here is a contrast between two types of houses. And I think you can see that this is also a contrast between two types of people, because there's a lot of personification here. Uh, it talks about these being neighbors, right, and being conscious. So the houses are like people, and if you look at the first one then, this is an uninhabited house that's detached from its neighbors. I would suggest that this very much represents the boy in the story. So the boy is detached, he's isolated, he doesn't quite connect well with the others. Um, the other houses, conscious of decent lives within them, these are the regular people in Ireland who feel that they, they want to be respectable. So they don't look too closely, right? They're conscious of decent lives. In the other houses, they just assume other people are decent. They're gazing at each other without much emotion. So they're kind of bland and dull, and it's as if they are tired, right? Brown is a common color in this, this story. It's a very brown and dark story. Uh, in these houses, it's almost as if they've kind of given up. They just look at each other without much emotion. So that particular contrast between the uninhabited house and these other houses, um, that's really the contrast then between the boy and the people around him. And you could read this in other ways as well. So for instance, the, the uninhabited house, I think you can relate this to Ireland more generally, which is also kind of detached, right? So Ireland, uh, but that would be a vaguer type of reference. And the way symbolism works in this story is that symbolism is often a little bit vague. It's not, not always totally accurate or totally precise. It's more about creating an atmosphere, okay? So an atmosphere where you can tell that there's more going on than just what seems literal and realistic. You see this also in the second paragraph. So as we scroll down here a little bit, let me do this for you. So the second paragraph, it talks about a priest who used to live in the boy's house. 
So the boy, by the way, does not live in the uninhabited house. That would make no sense because it's uninhabited. But there did used to uh, live a priest in his house who had died in the back drawing room. And this becomes a bit of a critical portrait of the priest as well. Because as you look at his legacy, what he has left behind is not all that impressive. It's really marked by decay and meaninglessness. So as you look at the description, it talks about the air being musty. Uh, he's got useless papers lying around that suggest that his life was somewhat useless. Uh, the, the pages are curled and damp. It's not a, a very attractive uh, picture. And if you look at where these pages are all found, it, it talks about them being in the waste room. So this room seems symbolic, right? His life seems to be a waste. I think you could also say things about him being uh, found dead in the back drawing room, which is typically for, for hosting visitors. Uh, but, you know, I'll let you decide on that. What is clear, however, is that this waste room is definitely symbolic, right? I think you can see that. And the books that he reads are also representative of a certain attitude that Joyce is criticizing. So very quickly then, the first book that's mentioned is The Abbot by Walter Scott. The priest likely re uh, read this book because it's a historical novel that deals with Mary, Queen of Scots, who was a Catholic ruler. The devout communicant, uh, a communicant is somebody who is allowed to receive the sacrament, right, the bread and the wine in the church. So this is a work of religious devotion that talks about how to be a good parishioner, how to be a good uh, communicant member in the church. And then finally, the memoirs of Vidoc. Uh, Vidoc was a, f a French uh, writer. He started out life as a criminal, and then he recounts in his memoirs how he turned things around, uh, joined the police force, and became the founder of France's security service. Now, this is a very exciting story, and it's really a story about repentance and a change of heart. Uh, a desire to contribute to law and order. So I think you could see this also as not just exciting reading, but fitting the pattern of what a priest would be looking for in, uh, in, in his entertainment. But if you look at the boy's response to this, the boy likes these books primarily because the leaves were yellow, especially the last one. So the memoirs of Vidoc, he likes it because the leaves were yellow. And what that shows is really a romantic attitude to reading. Think of when you're a kid, maybe you made these sort of old maps with um, tea leaves, right? And you kind of stain, stain the pages. That's the attitude here of looking for something romantic and old. Uh, it's not even clear that he's read the memoirs of Vidoc super closely, but he likes the kind of atmosphere that this evokes. The boy then, at the start of the story, seems quite drawn to what the priest stands for, right? The boy is attracted to this aspect of Catholicism, and his Catholicism is also going to uh, influence his devotion, his love for Mangan's sister down the road. Uh, so all these things are kind of wrapped up in each other. The infatuation, uh, his devotion, his religious feelings, they all come together in the story as it goes on. The leaves, by the way, are also a very nice transition to the wild garden, which is described next. And I alluded to this at the start of this video because it's probably one of the clear symbols in the text. So there's a wild garden with a central apple tree and a few straggling bushes. The tree in the garden is, of course, a symbol of the fall into sin, uh, of the transition from paradise to this sinful existence. And the way it's described here is in the most unpromising, depressing kind of way, right? Just a few straggling bushes, a wild garden. There's nothing glorious about this. Uh, that is all that the priest really seems to have left behind. So not a very hopeful picture. And then finally, we have this rusty bicycle pump. Um, and this is a, a symbol. It seems to be a symbol because we have all these symbols before it. But it's a symbol that seems to resist interpretation, because what do you do with it? It's just a bicycle pump. And yet there is the temptation to make some sense out of it, to connect it to all these other symbols. 
So I will give you a few possibilities here and you can take them or leave them. Uh, but I think the most important thing is that it, it's suggestive, but it doesn't actually tell you exactly what it means. Here then are a few possibilities. Uh, first of all, the Holy Spirit breathes into people and we can talk about air, right? Inspiration. Uh, so if we think of a rusty bicycle pump, which also blows out air, then we can say, okay, well, that's all that's left of his belief in spirit, spirituality. All we have is a bicycle pump <laughs> uh, that doesn't even really let much air out at all. Um, the other thing that we could say about this is that in the end, all we have left are material objects like bicycle pumps that are kind of useless. There is no spirituality left. The priest is gone, he, he's dead, and all he has left behind are these useless objects. So that is a view that suggests that all we have left is materialism, um, no spirituality whatsoever. And then finally, it might be suggested that, that this is a sexual symbol. It refers to his frustrated sexuality as a priest. Uh, and I'll let you explore that yourself if you like. But those are just a few possibilities that, that are there. But again, uh, Joyce doesn't exactly tell us what he is thinking here. And we are left with this kind of impression, right? An atmosphere that has been created for us. Similarly, with the final uh, bit of this paragraph, it talks about him being charitable, that he shows charity to institutions and to his sister. If you just read this on the surface, it does sound charitable. I mean, he leaves things behind. But if you want to be cynical, then you could read this maybe as a criticism as well. And again, a lot depends on the perspective that you are coming from. The next paragraph continues with the somewhat uh, depressing description. But I actually want to focus on the fact that amidst the depressing description, there is a little bit of hope. There's a glimmer of hope. And there is a kind of youthful life and spark that has not been suppressed yet. If you look at the beginning here then, very somber description, right? The short days of winter and so on. The cold air which stung us. Uh, it's a very dark description. And then we get to this description of the career of our play. The career is like the trajectory or the, the movement of our play, which brought us through the dark muddy lanes behind the houses where we ran the gauntlet of the rough tribes from the cottages. So running the gauntlet, what this refers to is that there used to be this kind of practice of having a bunch of people standing next to each other, uh, two rows of people, and you had to run through as they buffeted you with blows, with sticks, with uh, punching you, whatever the case might be, and you had to get to the other side. So the people kind of beating the boy up a little bit are the rough tribes from the cottages. This is in the countryside, and he has to come back from the countryside to the town, uh, and you, you start to see these kind of battles between different groups of boys. But as you look at this image, right, it reminds you a little bit of the street earlier, and it also foreshadows what's going to come later, which is this emphasis on uh, chivalry, daring, adventure, doing brave things and being willing to be challenged for them. So the boy really wants to show that he is willing to be brave, and he does that for Mangan's sister by trying to buy her a present. What we start to see then is that there is a little bit of bravery here, something more positive, in the midst of this descri description of muddy lanes, <laughs> uh, dark nights, um, all of this, this very dark imagery. You also see this earlier actually with the fact that the lamps are lifted, uh, lifting up their feeble lanterns as if they're trying desperately to fight against the darkness. And this fight seems woeful, it seems inadequate, but at least there's a little bit of resistance, a little bit of fight, fight that's left. Um, if you look further in the paragraph, it talks about the uncle who comes home. And throughout the story, the uncle is a figure who seems to have given up, right? He has to be safely housed. He seems a bit dangerous, uh, doesn't seem to like the boys very much. And he is he seems very depressed. So we'll come back to the figure of the uncle in a different lesson. Uh, but it's good to have this little hint here as well. So we have this bit of life from the boy, from the lanterns. And you also see it in the dark odorous stables where we, where we have this lovely description of how a coachman smoothed and combed a horse 
or shook music from the buckled harness. So there is music, right? There's a there's a harness that's making music. Um, the boys themselves are also glowing, it says, right? Our bodies glowed. So there is something a little bit left in terms of life and excitement and something that is worth striving for. So the whole tension in the story then becomes between giving up on the one hand, living in a brown place with imperturbable faces, right? You've given up on showing any emotion on your face. And on the other hand, still fighting on, trying to do something brave, trying to make a difference. That's the question, because is the boy just going to give up, especially at the end when he's had this somewhat depressing epiphany? Or is he going to still fight on, let his body glow, uh, do the brave thing and run the gauntlet? That's one of the big questions in this story. And that brings us then to Mangan's sister, because we basically come out of the shadows, out of the darkness, and we suddenly see this, this figure, this, this beautiful girl. The light shines on her. You can really see this at the end. And that is when the boy falls in love, when he is um, physically attracted to her. You can see that in the last line. And he goes, aha, <laughs> uh, she's beautiful. I want to I want to meet her. I want to know her. But he's extremely shy, as many teenage kids are. Uh, and so he doesn't quite know what to do. And I'm sure that if you've ever been in love yourself, you probably would have some sympathy for the boy in terms of his struggle in communicating that. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of the opening three paragraphs as the scene is set for the rest of the story uh, and we have a good sense of what James Joyce is doing here. He wants to give us an incredible amount of realism and that's par partially because he's criticizing spirituality but he also likes symbolism and he wants his meaning to be clear through these different symbols. Uh, so that, I think, is maybe a good way to read the opening.